All right, good evening, fellow astronomers, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The planetary season is coming to a close. The planets are now moving farther away from the Earth, off on their merry way in their respective orbits. And I wanted to make a video and go over what I learned uh, this, this year from all the amazing people that I had the, uh, the honor to learn from. Uh, I got a lot of great information this year. And I want to just go over some things. Hopefully it'll help you. This is by no means everything you need to know about planetary imaging, but hopefully it'll get you on your way. So when you're doing planets, you're talking very long focal lengths uh, and high F ratios because they are so... <laughs> My wife. Uh, because they're so bright, you can use very high F ratios. Uh, F stops, you know, a, a, a very slow telescope. Uh, so you can really stretch out that focal length. Um, so you want a, the, the largest aperture and longest focal length you can reasonably use um, to photograph planets because you're talking about a very, a very small target. And uh, to, to take those images, you want a camera that has a small sensor and can achieve very fast frame rates because you take videos to, uh, to get images of the planets. So you've got long focal length, small sensor, and the, uh, the first major drawback that you're going to run into with that kind of setup is how hard it is to find things in the night sky when you're only looking at, you know, 80 arc seconds of the sky. It can be very frustrating to find Mars when you're dialed in at that extremely long focal length. So what I found helps me the most is, and I didn't do that today actually, so I'm gonna be kicking myself, but uh, during the daytime, set up, point your telescope at something very far away. Like I use the uh, the high tension towers behind me. And uh, I, I get those in the field of view because those are easy to find during the day. You just get close and you run into a part of it and then you can move it to you know a specific point on it that you want. Uh, during the day and then go and line up your finder and your guide scope and everything you've got um, Line it up very precisely as precise as you possibly can To the same thing that your your field of view on your camera and your main scope is looking at and that will Help you tremendously because then you can go point it at Mars get it in the crosshairs on your finder scope and then it's nicely on your guide scope camera, and then you can center it in your guide scope camera, and then it's usually really easy from that point to just do a little uh, spiral search, and you'll you'll run into your target pretty quickly that way. So line everything up during the day, and it will make it very easy to find things at night. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, secondly, is a uh, you really have to have your system tuned, okay, to to achieve. The, uh, the maximum detail on things as, as small in your field of view as planets, you've got to have your system, if you've got an SCT or a Newtonian, you've got to have it collimated as accurately as possible and acclimated as well as possible. So, you know, keep, keep get your, if you've got a smaller scope like a 6 or 8 inch, you know, get that outside very early in the day so that by the time you're ready to use it, it has achieved ambient temperature and it will give you the best performance if you've got a bigger scope like i've got an 11 inch here or a 14 or even bigger that should just stay outside all the time because it takes forever make sure you get all the dust off of your camera because a dust moat in the middle of your camera will really make a big blurry blob on your planet and you don't want that so you get all anything that's close to the camera like filters barlows you know, I got a power mate on here. Anything that's down close to the camera, make sure you knock all the dust off of that because that's going to mess with you. And, uh, yeah, just take, you know, two or three minute videos in sharp cap or fire capture or whatever you want to do. You know, and that depends on the road. Something like Jupiter, you're not going to, you don't want more than two minutes, you know, two or three minutes because it's rotating so quickly. Or Mars, you can go a little longer, like three, four, five minutes on it, you know, something that's not rotating. Venus, forever, you know, Saturn, if you're not worried about trying to catch storms and the, pol the polar hexagon and things like that, octagon, hexagon, pentagon, whatever, I don't, I think it's a hexagon, the, the polar hexagon, the weird cloud thing that's on top of Saturn, um, you have to take pretty short videos 
because that Saturn rotates pretty quickly too. But if you're not worried about catching those details, you can, you know, if you just want to try to catch the de the, the um, demarcations in the uh, rings, you know, you can take as long a video as you want of Saturn. So yeah, video length matters. Shooting raw, and uh, you really want to get your frame rates high. So I always shoot in like a 640 by 480 window. Um, a region of interest on the camera because the rest of it's just black space so you're wasting processing power capturing a bunch of black space so make a region of interest in your camera as small as you can go to get the planet in there comfortably and uh, that will enable you to achieve the fastest frame rates you can. Um, I've only done one shot color um, if, if you really get serious about it you can get an auto, a motorized filter wheel and do mono and do your red blue and green channels and I've been using Infrared for a luminance layer, that's been really helpful because infrared makes it through the atmosphere so much quicker or so much, the, the wavelength's longer so it's not so easily deflected by the atmosphere. It bores down through it and gets down to us so you can actually see more detail in infrared than you can in the, uh, the visible wavelengths and most cameras are sensitive to infrared so it's nice to get a, a detail layer with infrared and then shoot your color and then combine them and it makes a nice detailed image and I'll show you how to do that. Well, Mars is coming up behind me right now. I'm gonna go ahead and finish setting up, shoot some video and uh, I'm not gonna use PixInsight for processing this time. I'm gonna show you how to do it just with, you know, I use SharpCap to capture it and then I'll use AutoStacker, Registax, which I hate. I, mean, I don't know how to use very well, but I should be able to squeeze something out of it. And then I'm gonna use Photoshop uh, to do the uh, to combine the infrared and color images. I'm going to shoot one color image and one infrared image and I'll show you how to combine those in Photoshop. Um, so the only paid software I'll be using is Photoshop tonight. Uh, so I'll show you how to process that. So I'll finish setting up and uh, I'll see you at the computer after I get the data. Alright back here at the computer um, seeing Turned out to be alright. I've noticed that seeing is good for me like between 9 and 11 p.m. After that it's just crap the rest of the night. You would think when it was straight up overhead it would be better but for some reason I guess it's just the heat coming off of Toledo or something. And that's one thing. Okay a couple things I forgot to mention. One thing when I was outside. Uh, thermals are very important uh, you got to make sure you're not looking over your house or you know warm cars or big patios or things that will be radiating heat throughout the night because those the thermal radiation will really screw up your uh, auto stack it will really screw you up um, so you want as you know as much field and trees and just natural cool things uh, between you and your target as possible. And you know um, there are a lot of other things you will need in your imaging train if you start getting serious about this. Uh, you'll need like an atmospheric dispersion corrector because the wavelengths are bent by the atmosphere, and uh, you know red makes it through quicker. The rest of the colors are kind of medium and then the blue wavelength goes off you know gets really deflected or really spread out more so you know you kind of have this smeared out rainbow if you don't use an atmospheric dispersion corrector um, the dispersion corrector is like a, an in, a prism that's inverted relative to the atmosphere so it kind of bends all those wavelengths back external hard drive if you're going to be doing a lot of video these are going to be big files. Every one of these three minute Mars files, especially at high frame rates, is five gigabytes. So if you're capturing on a laptop and then you want to do processing on your, your desktop because it's more powerful, it's going to take a long time to transfer those files over. So I just use a, an external hard drive and uh, capture it on the external outside, then bring the external hard drive in, plug it into my computer, and just process it like that without huge transfer times especially if you want to do like a nice time lapse of the rotation of Jupiter you'll, you'll burn up terabytes so an external hard drive can really help you out there but anyways these are the the few files um, that I got last night I did some Uranus 
too, and that was exciting. I can't wait to see what that looks like. But anyways, um, so you'll just open it up in Auto Stacker 3, and, uh, you know, here's all the frames of this video. And then I, I don't get real fancy with this. <coughs> I just click on Planet, um, place automatically place the AP grid. I'll sometimes put a couple more of them around. Like if it doesn't look like it's covering something, I'll put a couple more around. Um, and then normally, I like because I get like a hundred frames per second. Sometimes when I've got it plugged directly into the computer, I can get like three hundred frames per second. So then we're talking about like forty thousand frames of video. And when you've got that many frames, you can be choosy. So this, I only use the best 15% of frames out of 17,000. So I just write the percentage of the frames I want to use and then hit stack. And then it'll stack it. And you can actually load up all of them at the same time. You can go like this, load them up, and it'll load up all 10 of them. And then as long as it's all the same planet, you know, it's all going to be in the same spot. You just hit stack and then it'll run through and stack all of them. So I've already done all of those. Thank you, Auto Stacker. Now what you'll do is open up Registax. <coughs> and Auto Stacker will spit out these TIFF files. So you just open up one of these TIFF files that Auto Stacker spit out. And then uh, what you'll do is these are your wavelet adjustment layers i don't even monkey with wavelet layer one um i give this you know slide this slider is the, the percentage of that wavelet layer that's applied to the total image i usually slide that up and then you know turn that up to two and you can see it's already that's already made a heck of a, a big difference there show full image um, but anyways, just play with these sliders. And then this will sharpen your image up. And that's, you know, too much, obviously. I actually made one for these images already. But, yeah, when you play with it, get it sharpened up the way you want it. That looks pretty good. Hit do all and then hit save image. And then it'll save a bitmap of that image and then I just open a Photoshop um, I took I take infrared image this is a three minute infrared image and a three minute color image and then I blend them I normally do this in Pixinsight because it's a lot it's a little more uh, my style for this but it's not hard to do in Photoshop I'll show you how to do it quickly um, so yeah this is our color image this is our infrared image. And you can see how much more detail the infrared image has in it than the color image. And uh, so all I do is take my Im infrared image, drag it over to the color image, and that creates a new layer. Then I will lower the opacity of the color image so we can line it up. Sometimes it's not perfect. So, you know, you don't want to just line the images on top of each other with the borders of the image because sometimes Auto Stacker doesn't stack it up perfectly. So you want to double check and make sure that they are perfectly overlaid. You can, that's a little bit off. Okay, that's pretty good. Now, what we want to do is convert, or we want to get rid of the color in this infrared layer. So we'll just drop the saturation all the way down. That'll leave Mars looking a more natural color. And then what we do is we'll turn this opacity all the way up. And then for blend layer, do luminosity. And that will 
<coughs> um, use just the luminance data from the infrared channel and blend it with the background. Now it does not do well with the edges. You can see that it made the, the cloud look green. So what I do is just go around and erase the edges of the, uh, the luminance layer because the color is never very good for some reason when I do it this way. So I just kind of erase the edges of it like this and uh, that's all there is to it basically. See, so that's that's what the color image of Mars looked like, and then with the uh, the infrared data for detail, really uh, really made it look a, a lot more detailed there. And that's all there is to it. That's that's everything I know about planetary imaging. Um, I can't wait to learn more. And uh, leave any questions in the comments. And clear skies.